Hello, everyone. I'm Nadia Salami, the segment lead for cell and gene therapy at PecBio, and I'll be the host and moderator of today's webinar. I want to welcome everyone to this webinar with today's topic focused on the use of HiFi sequencing to characterize AAV genomes and how Novartis has been using and improving their use of the PecBio protocol. I'm joined today by two great researchers, Dr. Edward Oakley, a scientist at Novartis, who will present after me, and Dr. Liz Tseng, the AAV and RNA sequencing product manager at PacBio, who will join us as a panelist for the Q&A. We have a lot of great material to cover today, and the presentations portion of the webinar is pre-recorded, but will be followed by a live question and answer session with the presenters and Liz Tseng. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided on your attendee control panel. And we'll get to them either in the chat or at the end. We've also uploaded complementary literature to your control panel, so please feel free to download this and take it with you. We'll be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days. So please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And immediately following this webinar, you'll receive a brief questionnaire. Please do take the time to fill it out as it helps us understand your needs and plan for future webinars. You can stay up to date on upcoming webinars and events by visiting and bookmarking packb.com slash events. So with that, let's get started. I will start with a general introduction on AAP vectors and the tools that PacBio offers to support your gene therapy research. Adeno-associated virus AAV is a common vector for gene therapies. The wild-type AAV vector genome is about 4.7 kb long and is packaged into a capsid as shown on the left. The AAV genome contains two inverted terminal repeats that flank the rep and the cap genes. These two genes are essential for a replication of the genome and the encapsidation. To use AAV as a delivery vehicle in gene therapy, you can construct a genome in which you replace the rep and cap genes with your construct of choice. And these constructs can then be packaged into capsids and delivered to subjects. The packaging size limit is around 5 kb or 4.7 to be accurate. The challenge with recombinant AAV is that to package your construct of choice into the capsid, multiple plasmids are typically being transfected into a whole cell to produce the variants. As a result, in addition to the variants containing the expected full-length transgene construct from the vector genome plasmid, there'll also be AAV particles containing partial genomes and other impurities. Those partial genomes can be a variety of species. You can have truncated genomes, reverse packaged chimeric genomes that encompass sequences originating from the plasmid backbone, as well as sequences from packaging and helper plasmids. And you can have post-cell post genomic sequences that are chimeric with inverted terminal repeat containing vector sequences. And the elimination of production impurities and byproducts like MTAD capsids is key to the safety and efficacy of the final product. In addition, the other DNA contaminants may also carry safety issues that are just not well understood yet. And that's why measuring these impurities is so important. AAV has historically been difficult to sequence with conventional methods. This has mainly been due to the structure of the two ITR regions at both ends of the molecule. These regions are very problematic to sequence because the ITR regions can have different flip-flop configurations, they have a high GC content, and they also have palindromic sequences. All of these things makes it particularly difficult for short read technologies to cleanly sequence through the AAV genome structure and capture all the essential information about what's really happening with the AAV vector. As you can see in the figure on the bottom, short read sequencing usually leads to low coverage of the ITR and makes it difficult to correctly detect and assign chimeric molecules. A recent white paper by Dark Horse Consulting Group recommends the characterization of recombinant AAV products using sequencing methods. PacBio HiFi sequencing offers advantages over short read sequencing in all the important characteristics to be measured. 
The principle of high fi sequencing is the ligation of smart bell adapters to double-stranded DNA, followed by the sequencing of the circularized DNA template. The polymerase will pass the sequence multiple times, and the consensus sequence from these subreads is called a high fi read. High fi reads have 99.9% .9 accuracy, which is Q30, and can be up to 25 KB long. PAC Bio Hi Fi sequencing enables your AV vector research by allowing you to profile packaged genomes as a single intact molecule, assess vector integrity without extensive preparation, reveal the relative distribution of truncated genomes versus full length genomes in the vector preparation, detect reverse packaged genomes that encompass sequences originating from the plasmid backbone, identify sequences from packaging helper plasmids and to find host cell genomic sequences that are chimeric with inverted terminal repeat containing vector sequences. You can use HiFi reads along the whole development process of your AAV vector, ranging from CAPSA discovery through vector design to evaluation of your AAV vector preparation. Here's a recent example of a study that uses PecBio hi fi sequencing to screen for and identify novel AAV capsids. The bottleneck of AAV capsid design and discovery so far has been the inability of short read sequencing to capture the whole capsid gene. This limits its utility for libraries that contain whole capsid manipulations. The team around Stephen Gray from UT Southwestern used an amplicon-based approach to sequence the full length of the cap gene in their AAV libraries to find novel capsids that have the potential to function across species and that are specific to target tissues. In this case, it was the CNS. And in the end, they point out that this work highlights the utility of long-read sequencing for capsid discovery. Coming back to AAV genome sequencing to characterize impurities and truncations. The general workflow for using hi fi sequencing for AAV molecules is to first design and produce your AAV vector, then follow the library prep protocol and sequence on the SQL 2E system. The, the system has an on instrument AAV mode that makes the bioinformatic analysis easier. You can then analyze the data files that you get from the SQL to e instrument using either command line tools available on GitHub or point and click tools available through the PegBio compatible partner FormBio. Using PegBio hi fi reads, which are long and accurate, you have the ability to sequence the entire AV vector from end to end. The AV protocol is simple and flexible. Both single-stranded as well as self-complementary AAV vector genomes can be sequenced using the PacBio protocol. The basis of the protocol is to isolate the vector DNA, ligate smart belt adapters to double-stranded DNA, and then sequence on the SQL tree system. To make a smart belt library for sequencing requires double-stranded DNA with blunt ends to which the smart belt adapters can be ligated. So if the sample contains single-stranded AAV, an extra strand annealing step is required where a plus-strand genome anneals to a minus-strand genome. Self-complementary AAV molecules don't require the step, and they will only have one side accessible for adapter ligation, as you can see on the right. There are some molecule species that are likely more difficult to fully capture by sequencing because they may not allow for as efficient adapter ligation. Remember that the smart belt adapters typically ligate to double-stranded DNA. So if you have uh, oversized genomes, like shown here on the top left, or non-hybridized single-stranded AAV genomes, or single-stranded AAV genomes that hybridize in an asymmetric way and maybe not as efficient in the adapter ligation step. But there are modifications to the current protocol that researchers like our speaker, Edward Oakley, have made. Those will allow a more efficient capture of those molecule species to give you more confidence that you can see as much as possible of what is in your AAV vector preparation. With this, I would like to pass it on to our guest speaker, Edward Oakley. 
Edward, thank you so much for being here today and talking about your work on AV sequencing using the PAC Bio platform. My name is Edward Oakley, and um, I'm an Associate Director of Genomics at Novartis in Switzerland. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the ways uh, we've been using PacBio's uh, SmartLink technology to sequence AAV. As a little introduction, I will say a few words about the various types of AAV for those of you who are not familiar with it. Then I will say a few words about sequencing libraries on PacBio, in particular, the special features that PacBio have introduced into SmartLink in order to make this easier. And finally, I will end with a little bit of uh, what you actually might see in the data and what it means. OK, so there are, in principle, two types of AAV used in gene therapy. One type is called single-stranded AAV. This has a capacity of about 4.4 kilobases. And usually, this is your transgene with a promoter and a poly-A region together with the AAV uh, ITRs at each end. The second kind of AAV is called self-complementary. This is a slightly more exciting structure in that it has an ITR in the middle and the beginning and end ITRs are folded over in a complicated way at one end. Um, and the self-complementary AAV has a capacity of around 2.2 kilobases. Now, something to imagine is, first of all, it doesn't look like this in real life. <laughs> and secondly, if it did look like this in real life, it would probably be very difficult to ligate a smart belt onto this thing. Um, in particular, something to consider is also what would happen if you ligated a smart bell onto a self-complementary AAV that looks like the bottom picture, because then you would only get one smart bell rather than the usual case of a linear piece of DNA where you have two smart bells, one at the beginning and one at the end. OK, so with that, a word about smart bells and CCS. So. If we think of the um, standard PacBio library prep involves heat denaturation of the AAV, followed by the annealing of the two strands together. And if you do this, remember the two molecules on this picture colored in red and blue will come from different AAVs, which potentially may also have slightly different sequences. When you then ligate, according to the protocol, your smart bells, you would have a classical molecule with a smart bell um, at the beginning and at the end. With the self-complementary AAV, you would have only a single smart bell. And this is important because if you're not careful, um, it will confuse the CCS process. Now, why does it confuse CCS? Let's think about it. If you have this, CCS is expecting that the second time it sees a smart bell will be at the other end of the molecule. So we can think that really pass one, you would expect a forward strand. Let's imagine the sequence like this and pass. Um, and pass two ought to be the reverse complement. But what you would actually get from a one smart bell annealing experiment is you would get the same sequence again. And because CCS tries to correct it, assuming reverse complementarity, you kind of get a mess. Um, the good news is PacBio have come up with clever ways to fix this, but it's very important to know that you have to use 
AAV mode. The first thing about AAV mode is knowing where, it, where to find it. Uh, you have the Adeno associated virus option in SmartLink itself. And one thing that this does by default is it corrects for the fact that the ITRs actually look a bit like smart bells. So you have to make sure that they don't get cut off in the sequencing. Otherwise, you will have a bunch of random things happening that are not good for your data. The second thing is you have to stop CCS itself from becoming confused. And to do this, there is a nice option, which I believe is also introduced by default, which is detect and resolve heteroduplex reads. This must be set to yes. It doesn't matter if it's not necessary. If for some reason your reads were perfectly normal and you had no challenge with the forward and reverse read, everything would be fine. But if you need it, you need it. Um, this is also useful even when you have two single-stranded AAVs annealed together, because if one AAV had a big deletion in it and the other did not, this would allow CCS to notice that the two sequences are not the same and separate them accordingly. Now, let's have a quick word about thermal annealing. Um, thermal annealing is great, but I would argue it's not actually necessary. And the reason why this is a problem is if you're not careful when you do your thermal annealing, sometimes the SSAOV can actually be quite temperature sensitive. So here is a perfect AAV that if you just heat it up, it goes from being a band of on a tape station running at nearly 5 kb to, um, well, degradation products. There is the other question of, is your AAV actually intact? And this is a more biological question. So very often one might sequence AAV in order to understand if anything has gone wrong during the manufacture or if anything has um, gone wrong during the packaging. So if your expected size, as in this example, where this has been run on an alkaline gel in order to denature it, we expect everything to be this, the size at the top, but in fact, we get most of the material at a much shorter size and we might want to ask what exactly has happened in this sample. So to make sure that we don't miss anything, it's nice to be able to get anything that can be sequenced, sequenceable. And the way that we recommend doing this um, is to do something called natural complement formation. Natural complement formation is not something that we came up with. It's already been published in the literature many times. Um, and it's actually what AAV does normally within a cell. So if you imagine again our SSAAV molecule with its 3 prime OH, nicely annealed like this. Um, if you then add a DNA polymerase, for example, something like Equify, which is very similar to the enzyme that's used in sequencing normally on a PacBio instrument, the Equify 29 polymerase will just simply extend the 3' OH um, until it drops off the end, giving you something which is topologically identical to the SCAAV that we saw before. And in fact, it will do this during the damage repair process of the library prep anyway. So if you follow the standard PacBio library prep, you might actually observe some reads from SSAAV that appear to be too big, perhaps closer to 9 kb rather than the 4.5 kb that you expect. And then you, you may see your lab people scratching their heads and going, it's impossible, there's no way we have a 9 kb molecule in the tube. And where that 9 kb molecule came from is actually the damage repair process because you have a DNA polymerase, we assume, in the damage repair mix together with the DNTPs. 
So what we do is we don't want to have randomly damage repaired molecules in our sequencing experiment. So we do a pre-damage repair uh, fill-in using Equify plus DNTPs. And at this point, you can also spike in methylated DATP, which PacBio is very good at detecting. And what that will do is it will label the newly synthesized DNA. So post-sequencing, you can identify which bits were real and which bits were added by the library prep, which is very useful. And with that, we can have a brief little distraction into base kinetics. And with base kinetics, as you all know, the instrument is very good at looking at the how wide the incorporation peaks are and how big the gap between peaks are. This is the so-called pulse width and the interpulse duration. And this slide is uh, adapted from PacBio's own data about this, but the concept is relatively clear and it works very well, especially for bases like methylated adenosine. So how do we use this in practice? Well, in addition to the default pick the adeno associated virus option in SmartLink, you can also find in the advanced options that there is a CCS analysis output include kinetics. Set that to yes. And if you do that, if you don't need the kinetics, all it will do is make your BAM files a wee bit bigger. But if you need it, which in this case we do, it will add the kinetic information to the data so that you can do offline base calling. As it turns out, going back to the question about heating versus not heating, if we actually look, um, at, it turns out that most double-stranded um, SSAAV, most SSAAV is actually double-stranded anyway, when we sequence it, even if we don't do thermal annealing. When we look at the size distribution of reads, we see that the majority of product is actually at the 4.5 kb size regardless. And this, we assume, is because it comes from naturally um, annealed SSAAV that we had anyway in the tube, even without heating it up. But the molecules that were not annealed to something, those give this 9 kb peak that I was talking about, which has a structure as shown with one smart bell and then uh, this rather strange, almost like an SCAAV molecule, but it, where it is one strand is original and one strand is, and one half of the strand is created by the natural complement formation. So to summarize, PacBio data is awesome for AAV sequencing. Sequencing in AAV mode is essential, otherwise you will miss the ITR sequences because they will by default be removed by part of the standard processing that gets rid of the smart bells. And be careful, make sure that detect and resolve heteroduplexes is also selected. This is selected by default, so just resist the temptation to deselect it. Otherwise, CCS will go horribly wrong. It's very easy to tell if this has happened because you will have very low quality reads that are 4KB long. Normally on a sequencing read, you would expect a 4KB molecule should be probably close to Q90. Um, but if you have something which is more or less Q5 or Q10, then it probably means that something had gone badly wrong with CCS. PacBio default library prep can create these double length AAV reads by the natural complement formation as part of the damage repair process. And we would recommend that if you do a pre-damage repair, using methyl 6 DATP, then one can distinguish the native DNA from the library prep um, created molecules. And this is essentially done 
using um, a process. Uh, if you Google FiberSeq, then the FiberSeq tool, although it was developed for other purposes, FiberSeq gives you a perfect way of doing the base calling of the A's into methyl adenosine in AAV data, or also in the way that the pipeline was developed for some uh, exciting genomic analyses. Oh, and I have that already. Open source FiberSeq pipeline is really the best way out of the box to get the M6A if you choose to do this. Alternatively, you could just decide that as the forward and reverse molecules are simply uh, a copy of each other, you could just look for the ITR sequences in the reads. And if you see a 9KB read, you just trim it because you know how it was created. Thank you. And I would just like to acknowledge the incredible work of the team, Joel, G, Mike, Stefan, Yasmin, and also um, my boss, Ulrika. And I would like with that to end. And if you have any questions, I believe that will be possible live from now. Welcome back. Uh, thank you to Edward for the talk. Um, if you have questions, you can submit them in the question module and um, we'll be happy to answer them. Yes. Okay, so um, I see the questions coming in here. So maybe um, let's start with this one. How do you purify the DNA prior to self annealing or second strand synthesis? I think this goes for Edward, but maybe also this. I can't answer that question because we don't purify the DNA. It's purified by our collaborators. Got it. One thing that I do know is that some of our collaborators had the experience that some purification kits contain sodium azide, and the sodium azide appears to mess up the DNA concentration measurement. So that would be a warning if you think you've got more DNA than you have, um, have a look at whether you should be purifying away the sodium azide from the, some kits. That is great advice. Uh, this, off the top of your head, do you know which kit we recommend for um, DNA isolation for AAV library prep? Um, I think we just ask that people use, let me see if we have the specific kit. Um, in the protocol, we just ask them to use DNA's one to remove the non-capsid DNA, and that's about it. Great. Um, so there's some more questions um, about Ed's portion, Edward's portion. What about reads that don't have three prime RT? ITRs. The fill-in wouldn't happen for those, correct? Uh, correct. So if it was single-stranded and the three prime end was unable to anneal anywhere to the sequence, then yes, you would not see it. But if the three prime, but if any of the sequence is complementary to any of the other AAV molecules or material in the um, reaction, then it will be extended. But anything which is left as single stranded will be removed by the damage repair. Um, do you recommend Edward FiberSeq for all AAV prep? If not, when do you recommend it? Um, so I recommend FiberSeq um, for detecting the six methyl. Uh, dear ATP that you have incorporated. FiberSeq doesn't do anything else. It's a piece of software. Um, so it's the FiberSeq analysis tool for understanding the kinetics that come from the sequencer because PacBio doesn't at the moment do the M6A base calling by default on uh, AAV. Um, but if you do M6A incorporation, 
FiberSeq is a very quick and easy solution. If you don't do it, then it brings you nothing. And just as a follow-up, um, do you recommend doing the 6-methyl-A incorporation for each type of AAV molecule? Yes, because you can never be quite sure what's in the tube. So if you only had SCAAV as perfect SCAAV, it will do exactly nothing because it will be just the equivalent of the damage repair process that you anyway do. But if you have any material which is single-stranded or not um, flush, blunt-ended, then the um, natural complement formation will fill it in in order to make it as full length as possible. Great. Um, let me see the questions here. Um, there's a question. For, thank you, really great presentation. For quantifying the relative abundance of vector genome species of different lengths, what are PacBio's current recommendations for fragment size normalization given the size bias of PacBio sequencing? Maybe Liz can take that one. I see Edward smiling because I'm obviously he's going, I would love to hear what you have to say as well. Um, let's just put it this way, is that at this point in the PacBio official GitHub a, uh, AV analysis and also that's supported by a partner from Bio, we're simply giving out the number of reads as a proxy for the abundances. I want to mention that different customers would have different um, thoughts and processes. So I wanna hear what Edward's doing, but I want to point out that there recently was another publication by one of our other customers, Homology Medicines, where they have done some um, spike-ins and, and shown that uh, they have some formula using the sp uh, ladder spike-ins to do uh, an adjustment. So I just wanna say that um, PacBio at this point, or it does not have a official recommendation, but our customers are doing um, other processes. Thank you. So I think you, th you threw it open for me to make a comment as well. Um, <laughs> so I, I will just go with it, which is to say, we did a lot of controls in order to try and understand the loading bias. And definitely if you take something like a Lambda BST digest, um, which is a size ladder, you know that every molecule on a lambda BST digest is present at an equimolar concentration. You can then use that to test whether or not you have any loading bias from your library prep bead cleanups or your sequencing bead cleanup. And we certainly observed in our lab that the less than 3 kb binding kit 3.1, I think it is, gave yeah a very uniform loading for double-strand DNA in the range from 1 kb to 10 kb. Outside that range, it was not particularly uniform, but that's certainly quite a good range for AAV. Yeah. The slight challenge for AAV is that it's not properly double-stranded in the way that you expect, because an SC AAV will give a read which is twice as long as the molecule size um, because the molecule size is folded back on itself. So if you were to use any kind of correction based on read length, you'd have to bear in mind that the shape of the molecule will be very important for loading. And I think anything that is from an effective size of end-to-end -end distance double-stranded in the range of 1 kb to 10 kb should be pretty good with the binding kit 3.1 but if you correct you may introduce errors if you forget that the size is not quite what you think it is that's a really good uh, really good answer thanks edward uh, actually, there's there's one that kind of, another question that kind of goes along the same uh, line. So the question is: Most fragment analysis kits are designed for double-stranded DNA. How did you account for possible sizing inaccuracies or unavailability of single-stranded DNA ladders? Is that for me, or is that? For... Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
so when we the place where it is once we've made the libraries we think that our libraries are double stranded anyway because we've done either the natural complement formation and we've certainly done all the various damage repairs and everything when quantifying aav starting material we prefer to work on the principle of being reproducibly wrong rather than approximately correct the AAV has a lot of secondary structure in it, and it works just fine if you measure concentration by fluorescence using a qubit instrument. The measurement that you get from a qubit instrument is not the correct concentration, but in our hands, it is reproducibly wrong to the point that if we say this amount of qubit fluorescence is sufficient to make a good library. If you start doing um, absorbance measurements, which everything absorbs in a complicated way, it just becomes very, very difficult. But you could probably work out your own nanodrop scaling factors that would be appropriate. But for us, we do consistently wrong double-stranded DNA assays on the AAV to determine how much to use for library prep. And that appears to work for us very well. Great, thank you. Here's a question that I think is uh, maybe for Liz. Uh, what's your estimated sensitivity for detecting low level and rare impurities, especially considering they're single stranded? If they're single stranded, well, if they're single, also, I also want to add Edward as well. And the reason is I want to see our customers remember with PacBio, either we have a uh, learned experience with commercially available vectors, which are a little bit sometimes too, too um, clean, or we see what other customers have done. Um, but as what Edward said, if it's single stranded, if we hadn't either used thermal annealing or filling to actually create double strand, we wouldn't sequence it. And we know that's a, a, a drawback. You know, you can only sequence what you made um, a double-stranded smart bell structure out of. Um, and I think the second part is, what was the second part of that single-stranded question? What's your estimated sensitivity for detecting low-level and rare impurities? Yeah, okay. So just like level of detection. We mm -hmm. have not done like a spike-in where we know that we've added in a, a particular percentage. Um, maybe I would just use one example where we did a mixing but that was uh, 10%, so it's not really that, um, I would say it's not as, as low as people would like to see. Um, I'm curious to see, Edward, if you have any experience to where you knew there was some amount of impurities that you could detect. So we, we don't have any idea what level of impurity there is in the material to begin with, so it's quite hard to say a good answer. One thing that we occasionally observe is things like genomic DNA contamination from the cells which AAV may have been grown in. Um, and that's more a preparation thing, but it's a very good thing to watch. Um, because if you look at the read length distribution, you can see the genomic DNA contamination if you align the reads, for example, to things other than AAV. So if you grew it in a hex cell, you could align all of the reads to HG38. Um, and if nothing aligns to HG38, everything is fine. If it does or it aligns to something else, you can think of it a bit like a kind of metagenomic experiment. Uh, but in terms of sensitivity, um, we get what we see and we report the number of reads that we find. And that's about it. Uh, great, thank you. So actually here's a question that kind of uh, is along the same lines. Um, the question is, hi, thanks for the great presentation. I have a relatively general question. I wonder how quantitative pack biosequencing can be to evaluate AV products, specifically regarding the size bias and library preparation artifacts in AV sequencing. For example, would you rely on PEC biosequencing results to report the proportion of full-length AAV versus truncated molecules? Um, maybe let's start with Liz and then also go over to Ed, Edward. 
Well, I, we are not going to be the ones doing the reporting and the filing, but uh, let me just say that we've already discussed, um, and I think Edward had a good answer, is that from one to 10 KB, which is the normal size ratio of AAV, it seems like the abundances are somewhat trustworthy. Um, I do want to say that we know at least one customer using PacBio AAV sequencing is reporting um, the abundances as a supplement to their filing. Um, that that's one that's one use case uh, that we we've heard of. But I'd like to hear what Edward experiences with this. I think it's it's the same answer um, as I gave a few minutes ago. Um, it's very difficult to know what truth is. My personal belief is if the end-to-end -end distance of the molecule is between 1 kb and 10 kb, it should be pretty reliable. Um, but there is a big difference in between absolute quantification and semi-quantification. So. I haven't seen the data that can demonstrate that we can get it absolutely correct or even what the error bar would be on it. A good thing for the speaker to try maybe is key PCR. If they knew um, what uh, contaminants they had in the experiment, they could think about doing a key PCR experiment and then actually titrate and quantify that way and that would at least be another way of getting um, an angle on the um, quantification bias remembering of course that qpcr may include its own biases in this process so nothing is without bias but what is always good is to have consistent and reproducible biases and i think your ratio of deleted to full length based on the read length so long as it is within that 1 kb to 10 kb size that ratio should be consistently wrong and consistently wrong i think is fine for reporting purposes great thank you and here's a question for liz are you able to sequence and detect chimeric aab species for example transgene slash genomic DNA, transgene slash plasmid, or backloaded plasmids, et cetera. Also shorter than expected species. So again, I would also ask Edward that question because you are using a slightly different protocol. But um, yeah, as long as we can make a double-stranded uh, DNA out of it, either it's already self-complementary or it's single strand with thermal annealing. We have seen um, chimeric sequences at very low portions, though, because we're looking at, you know, commercially purified control vectors. But yeah, we can see if there are chimeric sequences that are, you know, transgene, plasmid, other things. Um, I, I think most of what we so most of the stuff that we see is largely what we expect to see as i said we also get a bit of a detection of other things um i think i can't really go into the details of the various things we might see except to say um anything which is double stranded you will be able to detect um and anything which isn't double stranded you will probably miss Great. Actually, with that, since you just mentioned the library prep list, can the DNA damage repair step be skipped in the libraries in the library prep? I don't think so, and but I don't know if we've tried. I think we. I have to go back and look in our experience if we if we tried to skip the step. I think it would be a terrible idea to skip. Yeah. Um, the the only thing that you have to remember is that the DNA damage if you don't do natural complement formation, the DNA damage repair step does include um, DNTPs and a polymerase, so you will naturally do some natural complement formation anyway in the damage repair process. Um, so if you don't add uh, labeled DATP, you still might observe a 9 KB product on your sequencing. And we believe that those come from the damage repair. Right. And um, Edward, there's another question regarding the uh, natural complement formation. Um, do you use random primers for 
the second strand synthesis, it says here. We don't use random primers because I don't really see why that would help. Um, we use um, the AAV three prime end and we just extend that. So if the AAV three prime end is annealed to itself, like it was shown in the pictures, then that will be able to extend and create uh, sort of uh, like an SCAAV out of an SSAAV, just a very big molecule. If everything is annealed quite happily and there's no free and everything is double stranded anyway, then it won't do anything. But we don't use random primers. We use the AAV itself. Thank you. Uh, Liz, how many AAV samples are you able to multiplex on a SQL to E? And what will the number of samples multiplexed on the Revio be? Right. So the protocol right now allows for 24 plex. We've tested those 24. Um, but as far as I can tell, our customers um, do anything between 8, 12, and I think occasionally 24, but usually 12. I think the limit is more like a sample acquisition is whether they actually will accumulate up to 24 samples. For number of reads, um, I think we're seeing on SQL 2 anywhere between a million to four million reads per the entire smart cell. If you multiplex, it would be less per uh, plexity. For Revio, um, we don't have that number yet. Um, as, as you know, AAV is not currently supported on Revio, but we are aiming to support AAV mode and AAV sequencing on Revio very soon. So let's wait for that and then we'll We'll let you know the official expected yield. Wonderful. And uh, Liz, I, I also have one question for you myself. Uh, you know, which bioinformatic tools do we provide to analyze the packed bio AAV data, and where where can I find it? Yeah. So currently, um, it is on a GitHub page. There's two ways to access it. One is on the GitHub page, GitHub.com/slash M-A-G-D-O-L-L -L, uh, slash A-A-V. However, um, this is a command line only tool which requires in past bioinformatics uh, command line expertise. I want to mention that we have partnered with FormBio, um, I think it's formbio.com, and they will offer a GUI cloud-based solution for analyzing PacBio data using my uh, AAV analysis. They offer much more than just uh, PAC bio analysis. They can also offer um, other gene therapy related services. Um, so I do recommend checking them out regardless. Um, so yeah, that's what we currently, uh, but there is the on instrument AAV mode. I want to separate the secondary analysis of what I'm mentioning now, which is, you know, AAV mode that Edward mentioned is properly generating self complement aware, SEAV structure aware CCS slash hi-fi reads that could be then properly used for secondary analysis, either through my GitHub, through FormBio, and you know, if you're doing whatever it's doing, like special filling, then uh, custom tools, apparently what's using FiberSeq. Right. Great, thank you. Um... Are there any bioinformatics tools for methylation sequencing, like the 6-methyl-A for AAV? Right. Um, as Edward mentioned, currently we don't have an official um, tool, but uh, apparently FiberSeq works. That's really great to know. Excellent. Um, there is a question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but I will ask you, Edward. Do you have any experience comparing pack bio sequencing for AAV and ONT sequencing in terms of AAV genome read populations? If so, why do you prefer pack bio? Um, so our lab specifically hasn't used the Oxford Nanopore for it, but I know that other people in the organization have used Oxford Nanopore. I think um, my views on this are that the nanopore is a really great technology as well and i apologize to pagpio for saying that um but it's um it has the same implicit challenge which is that for the nanopore you also need to ligate an adapter 
Um, and you could either do a nanopore ligation using a splint ligation, a bit like they do for the direct RNA sequencing, or you could make the um, AAV double-stranded in the ways that we've been talking about already. But ultimately, nanopore requires um, that you can ligate something onto the end of the molecule too. So I suspect that those challenges would be the same for both technologies. And certainly, if we were doing nanopore sequencing, I would also recommend doing natural complement formation for that. Um, in terms of why we use PacBio over nanopore, it's basically because um, the throughput and multiplexing that we have with um, the PacBio is currently really good. And so um, we, we use it because we have a bigger sequence capacity in our lab for doing um, pack bio sequencing, but that is uh, yeah. But I think if people want to try with nanopore, that's also very good. And certainly nanopore do provide tools for detection of modified bases as well. So you could probably detect methylated six um, methyl A um, if you did natural complement formation for that as well. Great, thank you. So unfortunately, I see there are more questions, but we're coming to the end of our time. So I would like to thank Edward and Liz today uh, for their time and for sharing their expertise with us. Um, just as a reminder, following this webinar, you'll receive a brief questionnaire. Please do take the time and fill it out. And lastly, I have a quick announcement to make. I just bring this up. So there will be another webinar featuring Liz Tseng um, with our partner FormBio. And you can register for the webinar, which will be on November 15th at 10 a.m. by using this QR code. You'll also have this flyer in your materials that are available for download. And, sorry. And with this, I would like to thank you again. Thanks for joining us today. And we hope you'll join us for a future webinar. Take care and have a great day.